Kim, Randy, thank you for choosing such a good church. And I enjoy coming to your home. Um, Matthew 18 seemed to be such a, a wonderful passage. It mentions little children. We had a baptism. It was perfect. Let's see how long that stays perfect. Would you um, <coughs> open your minds and hearts to this portion of God's word? You'll find it in Matthew 18, the first nine verses. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a large millstone hung around uh, his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to to the world Because the things that cause people to sin, such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed and crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Would you pray with me? (coughs) Father, at once uh, a story of a young child being brought before adults and said, To have Jesus say, we've got to become like that. And then to have the stern warnings, warnings of temptation and sin. And Lord, we're reminded very graphically that sin is to be taken seriously. And our response to temptation is to be taken seriously. So Lord, open our minds and hearts maybe to think about this in just a little different way this morning. And through the work of your Holy Spirit, work in us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Started out real sweet, didn't it? Little children. And then we got into the graphic warnings about sin and temptation. And I want us to see it all in context. You know, if you were to look at the, especially Mark 9, another. A gospel writer who covered this same story, he added something just before where we pick up in Matthew 18. <coughs> Jesus had just told his apostles in Mark 9, look, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed and I am going to be killed. And that's where Matthew picks it up at that point. The disciples respond to this this very difficult saying that Jesus had just given them. I'm going to be betrayed and killed. And And the disciples say, well, then who's going to be the greatest? You know, if you were Jesus, if you were Jesus, how would you have responded to the disciples asking such a ridiculous question after he had just said, I'm going to be betrayed and killed? You know, last week, uh, I'm glad we don't have this problem anymore in the church, you know, of, um, you know, people, people in the church, not just pastors, people in the church arguing about who's the greatest, who has the biggest impact. Uh, 
Brooks and Reva were speaking at a church very close to our home up in Roanoke. And there was, there was a person there that, um, I'm just going to say, we're not on each other's Christmas card list. And, say, and he's always telling me you know, about, about what he does and he teaches in Africa. So I thought, here's something to, to link us together and we'll, we'll be best friends from now on. And, and I said, you know, I, I have great news. I said, last, last two summers, Martha and I got to go to Africa, uh, to Uganda, and, and we got to teach. I, but the, the great part of it is that we fly over and we walk into a room and there are a hundred pastors that have, been, that have been rounded up by one specific pastor that puts this conference on. And my point was, they weren't coming to hear me. The work of this guy over in, <coughs> excuse me, over in Africa has done all this work. And, and the 100 pastors responded to that. And I said, and 100 pastors were sitting out there. And he said, well, when I go over, I have 300. I went, okay, maybe it's good that I'm working on this passage. Uh, it is alive and well in our churches 2,000 years after Jesus told this story and pulled this kid out and gave this, his disciples this picture of how we must become in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. But I had already forgotten that, uh, you know, when you go to General Assembly, I'm going to pick on General Assembly for just a second. When you go to General Assembly, you have to be very subtle uh, to, to boast about, you know, how many people are in your church and what the size of your budget is. And someone said, you know, it would save so much angst uh, amongst the pastors because how am I going to tell all my friends that my church is growing and we have a budget of a gazillion dollars? So he came up with this idea of a, uh, of a name card. You know, the hello, my name is. It says, you know, mine would say, hello, my name is John Furman. And... My membership in my church is X number of people, and my budget is X number. And then you don't even have to ask or subtly bring it out in a conversation. It's there. What a great idea. You know, if I do this, Archie, and I make a lot of money, I'll split it with you, okay? So. Or we'll send it to Japan, one or the other. You know, it's not just a problem with pastors. You know, if we talk to youth volunteers, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about our youth program because it's a growing program. It's a good program. And the music program, I've enjoyed the music this morning. Uh, my, my compliments to those leading us in worship. It's wonderful. But, um, you know, missions, we always want to say, you know, our church puts more money, a bigger a percentage of our budget into missions than any other church. Even kitchens. I mean, you know, we'll argue about who has the best kitchen crew in each church. Bigger, better, greater. We're still carrying this out 2,000 years after Jesus pulls this kid up and says, you've got to be like him. You know, I was at a conference at a church in, in Charlotte and, and, and <coughs> excuse me, the pastor uh, came out and he was showing me one of the uh, children's workers. Uh, he says, we have a stroller that can push 15 children at one time. It's the best thing in all of Charlotte. And I was going, wow, 2,000 years later, we're arguing about who has the biggest stroller. But back to Matthew. If indeed you were Jesus, what would you have done if the disciples said, hey, who's going to be the greatest once you're killed? But Jesus, in a way that shows grace more than anything that I could ever imagine for myself, instead of just hitting him in the head, he takes a little child and says, bring the kid to me. And he puts this child in front of the disciples, the apostles. And you go, why, why a child? He could have just said, your thinking is all messed up. 
But he uses a child. Maybe it was because children are innocent. I mean, you know, if you got a picture of John's face in your mind now, you'll think, what a sweet, innocent, perfect, the best grandson, you know, that Randy and I could have. That's just my opinion. Innocence. We're the greatest. There's no pretense with children. And John and the other young children in here are totally dependent upon parents to meet their needs. Dependent is as close as we're going to get to maybe why Jesus called a little kid up and used him as an illustration. But he did this to drive home a point. The point is, <coughs> excuse me, and now I'm sorry I'm coughing it. I had fully planned on being over this by the time I got here. The key point to it is this. Young children bring nothing to the table. They are totally dependent. You know, there's a, um, the word for child, uh, pedium, is the same word we get pedi- uh, pediatrician. Anything dealing with young children, the peds, okay? The Greek word, that's where we get child. But if you look at, (coughs) excuse me, another Greek word for foot. It's from the same root word. And it really goes back to uh, back in this time uh, when, when a family was traveling or you know, there, here's the adult, and the adult is, is, is in the carriage, and he's riding, or he's on the horse riding. Guess where the children were? Walking. So they became the, the people of the foot. And, and so that's why foot and, and children have the same root word. They were just almost like in the way. So so here's Jesus saying, you need to be like this person that everyone at that time would say brings nothing to the table. Man, (coughs) this child is really of not great value. There there are no legal rights for this child. Uh, There's no power in, 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 in the society for a child. He brings nothing to the table legally, socially, emotionally. It's just a young before he becomes an adult kid. And Jesus is driving home this point. Look, folks, you want to be great? Unless you change, change your thinking, change the way you think about all of culture, Unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to change from thinking of yourself as, I'm one of the 12. I got my act together. To, I am like this little child with no legal power, with no social power, with no... Nothing. Totally dependent. Brings nothing to the table. And so this is the point Jesus is bringing. When we say we have come to saving faith, when we say we understand the gospel, we better have this picture in mind also. You're a nice man and you're also tired of hearing me hack, right? Thank you. (laughs) And everyone here thinks it's water. Okay, so um, <laughs> we come to saving faith. Oh my! It is not something that we gain power. It is something where we see that when we were born, we had nothing, and when we come to an understanding of the gospel, we're acknowledging we come as a child, totally dependent. on the one meeting our needs, who's God himself. 
That's the point he's, he's driving. In, a, in case we miss that in Matthew, God in his infinite wisdom gives us other chances to pick up this same message. <clears throat> it's like tomorrow night, you know, in case y'all didn't know it, there's a football game tomorrow night. <clears throat> and let's just say for a moment, I don't, I don't want to you know, go too far with this, but let's just say for a moment, in the middle of the game, the referee makes a call and, and there's, a, there's a coach named Dabo that, that coaches one of the teams. And let's just say he disagrees with the referee and he challenges the referee. And, and so what they'll do is all the guys with their striped shirts and they'll go over and they'll huddle up and there are people in another state and they're looking at, at the same play from all these different angles. And then after about three hours, he'll come out and... The, and the announcers on the TV go, man, this is getting longer every game. And, and so they'll say, we overturn the call that was just made. Or we uphold the call that was just made. And, and so you know, they can see, was his foot in bounds? You know, did he have possession of the ball? All those questions that in naked eye in a split second, maybe they didn't see. But just just so they can make the perfect call. They look at all the different cameras, all the multitude of camera angles, and they can see, oh yeah, his foot was in. Oh, he never really had possession of the ball. What God did in in Philippians chapter two is to give us a different angle on this same play. Same point, different angle. Matthew's saying, hey apostles, Change. Be like this kid. Paul in Philippians is saying, hey, Christian, I want you to think about your mind. Do you have the same mind as the mind of Christ? Do you think like Jesus? Is your attitude like that of Jesus? And and so (coughs) if you look at Philippians 2 with me, Beginning at verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So now we're talking about our attitudes. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God, who exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." Listen, what Paul gives us here is very simple. Three facts. Number one, Jesus is God. It wasn't that he was God and now he's not. He is God. But then he became man. And then as a man, he became obedient. An obedient servant. Obedience to death. Even death on a cross. In verse 7, look at it. He says, uh, he made himself nothing. Could also be translated, he he emptied himself. He became totally dependent upon God, his father. He only spoke his father's words. He only pursued the father's will. And he carried out his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit because he was totally man like us and so Paul gives us this picture here's here's this one we call Jesus he was God he became man remaining God and while he was man 
He was totally obedient to the Father, only speaking the Father's words and dependent upon the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he he fed 5,000. He healed sick. He calmed storms all through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see something very similar to our situation today? We are to be totally dependent upon God, upon his word, upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, um, was it next week? Maybe it's the anniversary of Roe versus Wade. But you know, it's been 47 years uh, since that ruling was, was handed down. And so much has changed even in the past 10 years. You know, we can talk about you know, we have our formula of how to deal with this. We'll get a certain number of politicians elected. We'll get so many people in the, in the courts put on the bench. We'll do these things. We have our formulas of how we can fix this. But you know, it's all changed now. There's a pill, the morning after pill. What we used to call you know, the, the abortion clinics, they will be a thing of the past because you don't need to go there. In fact, we have no idea how many people who are not going there are carrying out the same process through pills and chemistry. We've lost. I don't want to be the bearer of bad tidings, but we have lost. But in this loss, maybe we'll quit thinking of, we have the formula that's going to fix this. And maybe we'll become dependent upon the work of the Holy Spirit, changing hearts and minds of people we don't usually talk to. And maybe things will change. But it's not a formula. It's a dependence upon God. You know, we, we hear Brooks and Reva stand up and, <coughs> and talk about ministry in Japan. One-tenth of one percent. You know, you get on a train with a thousand people. How many other Christians are you going to have <coughs> on that train? Math teachers, y'all work it out. I think that's about the interest rate on my checking account. <coughs> You know, when we think back to Randy's dad uh, being a missionary in Japan, and so many years later, uh, his son back as a missionary in Japan, and we look at that number, one-tenth of one percent, are we winning? And the answer is no. And we come back to our churches and we say, man, we need to send more short-term missionaries out. We need to send more missionaries out. We need to send more money out. And all these things are good. I'm not arguing with them. But if we start thinking about these pieces of a formula will fix the problem, we're sadly mistaken. And we will be here when, when Marley and Quinn and John are still in Japan as missionaries and they're in here talking and Archie, you and I are too old to even climb up the stairs. And they'll say, and we still have one-tenth of one percent Christian population in Japan. Maybe we need to become more dependent upon the working of the Holy Spirit and God working and quit thinking of Hey, we have a formula that's going to pull this off. I have a relative that literally called me last night and said, hey, my grandson is, um, I'm going to take him to go see this movie and he'll, he'll, he'll be pro-life if I can just get him to this movie. And I'm going, you know, I'm all for it. But we're dependent upon things that, that we can control. We're dependent upon this formula that we put together. Grandson, movie, pro-life. It doesn't work that way. Are you praying for his, for his spiritual life that he would come to a saving faith of our Savior? We naturally want formulas for anything. 
And all you have to do is turn on the TV and you will see formulas for everything. Every aspect of life. In church, out of church, missions, pro-life stuff. Your family, this is how you fix it. Here's the formula. It's easier to plug in a formula than it is to, to be like a little child totally dependent upon the mom, the dad, meeting the needs that that child has. It's so much easier to say, hey, let's plug in a formula. Jesus says, it's not formulas, it's dependence. But the very next thing he says, he deals with temptation. Temptation. Why did he jump from from this happy thing to to temptation because he says you will face it it's going to come from the world it's going to come from within the church we are constantly going to be facing temptation and when we do how are we going to deal with it well once again we have instant replay and and we can look at one more place in 1 Corinthians if you'll turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13. Jesus gives us a very hard news version of this. Man, if your hand's tempting you, cut it off. Well, he's not talking about mutilation. He's talking about some spiritual surgery that needs to be carried out. Paul deals with it a little in a little more laid back way, though no less easy. In verse 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he also provides a way out so that you can stand up under it. Two things I want you to, uh, to hear in this short version of the instant replay. Number one, any temptation you face, everybody in this congregation faces it. We don't talk about it. Because we don't want other people to know we're dealing with it. But in dealing with it that way, then what we've done is isolated ourselves, thinking we're the only ones that ever have this problem, and we feel isolated, and the problem is bigger than me, and we can't do a thing about it, and we just give up. You know, there was a, uh, th- there was a men's Bible study in the church where I used to work, and, and um that these men met together. I think it was three years. And finally, one of them walked into this Bible study. No one was opening up. They would do their cognitive exercises when they got together and they could, they could talk about what the verse meant. But no one ever opened up and said, you wouldn't believe what's going on in my family. I feel like such a failure. And as soon as he said that, every man in that Bible study went, same thing's happening in my family. And then all of a sudden they started supporting each other and all of a sudden they were praying for each other and all of a sudden they knew that they weren't in over their heads that God could do something because he said we all face this temptation. But he goes beyond that. He talks about God is faithful and he will provide a way out. He will provide the way out. There was a movie made back in uh, 2001, Owen Wilson, who never played a serious part, but he did in this movie called uh, Behind Enemy Lines, I think. It's about the war in Bosnia, and he was shot down. He was a pilot uh, behind enemy lines. And, and it was always like, are they going to come rescue him? Can the people, you know, anyway, it, that was a big part of the movie. But the gist of it is, finally, they come in to rescue him and they, they park the, the helicopter, that's probably not the right word, uh, in the middle of this field, and, and Owen Wilson has to run through the field to get to the helicopter, which was his way out. 
the way out was provided. He still had to run to the helicopter. And, you know, they wanted to do bodily harm to him. And so the fear was still in him, but he's running to the thing that was provided for him, his rescue, his way out. And what I want you to see is God is faithful. Paul wants to remind us of that. He's faithful. He's going to provide that helicopter. And we're going to go through days where we feel like we're running through a field and people are shooting live ammunition. But he has provided the way out. Temptation. Yeah, it's serious. So serious that, that, that Jesus says, hey, if you see the cause of it, I don't care if it's your eye, your hand, your foot, get rid of it. And the way Paul says, hey, look, Anything you're facing, everybody in this congregation is facing the same thing, the same temptations. And we will go through it together as we encourage each other. But you know what? In order for us to know that, you know, you need to be honest with each other. And we have a faithful God who has provided our way out. He is faithful and he provides. But we still have to get out to the helicopter. But that's his promise to us. He has that way of escape. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you. Thank you that as believers we can celebrate that you're, you're faithful and you're going to always provide that way of escape. We also acknowledge that you're a God who has been faithful. And as we have fallen to these temptations... Oh, Lord, you have provided a way of our forgiveness that your son Jesus went to the cross. And as we fall, as we commit these sins and falling to temptation, oh, Father, you have provided the way of forgiveness in your son Jesus' death on the cross. There isn't anything we can do to pay for it. And so we can only step back and say, God, you have been faithful. You have provided the means of our forgiveness. And we trust in your means that you provided through your son and that alone. Thank you for being that faithful God. Thank you for a time that we can sit together, all of us facing our own temptations, but together as a congregation, bearing each other up. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.